This is your DM guide for Divine Contention, the third and final expansion adventure for the Dragon of Icepire Peak from the D&D Essentials Kit. Hi, Bob here, and welcome to Bob World Builder, where we learn how to have more fun playing D&D together. So hit that subscribe button to get DM guides for Icebuyer Peak, Rime of the Frostmaiden, and all kinds of other D&D topics under your subscriptions tab every Wednesday. And I've got some good news, including a new giveaway. So be sure to stick around till the end of this video to hear that announcement. Divine Contention is designed for 1 to 6 characters of 11th to 12th level, and it can be run as a standalone adventure or as the exciting conclusion to the Beyond Icepire Peak trilogy. Just like Stormlord's Wrath and Sleeping Dragon's Wake, it takes place around Leilan, and there are only a few new changes due to the ongoing reconstruction. First, Aubrey's Peculiarity Shop, The Barge Yard, The Fishery, House of Thalavar, Idol Island, Lathander's Shrine, Torver's Post, The Town Square, The Tamora Shrine, and The Umberhulk Shell Inn are unchanged from the previous modules. But now we have the Knight's Goblet Inn, where your presumably very wealthy adventurers can stay if they're willing to surrender their weapons and swear a knightly oath to the half-elven owner, Amirasol Touchfire, to behave during their stay. There are also new town gates where travelers are charged a silver piece to pass with a beast of burden. There's a shrine to Tyr, god of justice, where disputes are settled by a dwarven priest, Vagol Kuskolt. And there's the Quayside Harbor where characters must register their boats with the human harbor master, Demel's Attack Wind, or pay a daily fee. And unfortunately for Leilan, the town is besieged after your party completes two of the three starting quests just can't catch a break. But hey, they level up after ending the attack and go on to resolve the cultish threats once and for all. I recommend starting with Icing Death and Twinkle, in which the party is sent to convince the Lord Protector of Neverwinter, Daggold Neverember, to help secure the high road against the cults. What the party won't know is that the crews of these two ships are all drow, magically disguised as humans, and are working for Jarlaxle Banray an infamous renegade drow who wants Neverember to protect the coast for his own business purposes and has convinced the Leyland Town Council to send the party north. Funny enough, characters can catch on pretty easily by just observing the crew, noticing their elvish accent, weird hand signals, and probably their sensitivity to sunlight. So I suggest either leaning into the humor or increasing that perception check DC so your party can get a hint that something is off but not be quite sure what's going on. Also pretty funny, the Icing Death carries a larger-than-life statue of Driss Do Erden, everyone's favorite drow ranger, that can shoot a stream of water out of its mouth, and the Twinkle has a powerful anti-magic crystal, which could allow the players to undisguise the ship if moved, or just be a super handy tool when facing the cults later on. The actual journey to Neverwinter provides a day to investigate the ships and plan their plea to Daggle Neverember, for which the book rightfully encourages more than a mere persuasion check, suggesting intimidation, performance, or even history, with scaled results for their success. But that discussion is the only thing they do in Neverwinter. So if you or your players are interested in what adventure the city has to offer, I recommend checking out my new supplement, Urban Encounters for Neverwinter. It has a one-page breakdown of the important lore and locations for the city, a big map, and 20 simple encounter hooks. Check out the full video review up here and use the affiliate links below to support the channel. Now, the journey back to Leilan is where things get interesting. Talos priest Galos Windrage sends invisible stalkers and creates a storm to thwart these warships. But, according to the DMG, these ships have 500 HP each, so even if the party is caught fending off the invisible stalkers and can't perform the listed ability checks to survive the storm, the ship will only take a measly 44 damage on average. So I would suggest at least doubling the damage from the storm because this may force your party to abandon ship and board one of the attacking ships, the Throat Cutter and Thunderstrike, which have their own detailed weapons and crews. Your initiative for this naval combat should definitely go ship by ship, using their siege weapons to sink each other, perhaps during the chase back to Leilan, and ideally while tracking your PC's initiative separately as they try to take out enemy captains or siege weapons. 
After this big battle at sea, Dumathoin's Gulch is a more simple combat focused quest during which the party must obtain a magical grenade from those wacky gnomes of Nomengard at a midpoint location called Dumathoin's Gulch. In their few hours of northward travel, the party meets Bindlement Mincemower, running from werebores. But I would replace this gnome with one that your party met back in Nomengard, and the werebores with actual anchorites of Talos, or one of the undead creatures that she says attacked the gulch earlier that day, to better indicate what's waiting there for the party. You can also provide this hint with the gruesome remains of wildlife slaughtered by the bone claw and sword wraiths by having the wounds be riddled with black necromantic energy. And be sure to tell your players that Fibblestib and Dabbledob, the original gnome adventures from Nomengard, are in trouble there. Then, contrary to the book, I would definitely only use one bone claw, raising its HP if necessary but taking advantage of the shadow jump feature as recommended to keep it out of reach so the bone claw will be challenging to defeat while also fending off the sword wraiths which form from the bones around the moonstone. Basically, make the party hate this bone claw, even give it a name, because bone claws always reincarnate as long as their master is alive, so it can turn up again during the Siege of Leilan later in this adventure. Then, to maybe help your players if necessary, don't allow the undead to move within 10 feet of the moonstone. I think this aid will feel less like a cop-out than the gnome reinforcements and the statue spirit. Just make sure they actually retrieve both grenade parts from Fibblestib and Dabbledob before they leave. This crazy weapon is like casting fireball twice with a bigger area of effect that can also stun you and create three other crazy effects from the Wand of Wonders table which I am briefly including here in case you don't have the Dungeon Master's Guide. You're welcome. In the third and most simple starter quest, Thalavar's Beacon, your characters reunite with the wizard Galio from the Stormlord's Wrath to capture and then kill four star spawn manglers from the ethereal plane which he accidentally releases when trying to obtain a powerful Netherese artifact called the Runestone, which can undo actions performed within the last 24 hours. Fortunately, some friendly ghosts called the Swords of Leilan appear afterwards to warn the party of the artifact's dangers, but it could be really useful against the cults, so it's your job to also tempt them into taking it for themselves. And precisely when this danger is revealed, you should begin the events of the Leilan Besieged quest, where Ulleron Mortis and Feralai Stormsworn both attack Leilan to retrieve this artifact. This epic battle uses large-scale narrative combat to determine the outcome, essentially follow the events on the flowchart which are each tied to detailed encounters, and mark them appropriately with victories or defeats. Then determine the party's final result from crushing defeat, where Ulleron gets the runestone, to great victory, where Leilan holds, the cult leaders die, and the evil dragon spirit is driven away. As written, as long as your party avoids that crushing defeat, the town council raises statues in the character's honor, the green dragon becomes an ally, and you learn that Aubrey from the Peculiarity Shop was a ghost the whole time. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And Lord Neverember will pay the party to squash these cults for good. So Stormlord's hideout takes your PCs back to the undead ship from Sleeping Dragon's Wake to sink it once and for all but I still suggest having your party try to claim it for themselves. And overall, I think these epic encounters, Rock Patrol, Tornado, and Rise of the Stormlord where Talos himself rises to smite Feralai, or whoever is defending the ship at this point, should just be used during the final siege of Leilan. Ebon Death's Mausoleum, on the other hand, is a pretty solid dungeon, buried deep beneath the mirror of dead men, where the party must seek and destroy Ebon Death's malevolent spirit. Which is not too difficult, because they can rest between the challenging encounters with cultists and undead before they face Ebon Death, who's apparently only a CR4 creature. But we've already had the major climax, so this is fine. And at last, your party can claim a dragon's treasure hoard from this lair. And before we get to that giveaway announcement, you know how I always say to check the comments of these videos for great tips from other DMs? Well, one loyal subscriber who's been a patron and a YouTube member since the beginning has shared a lot of awesome ideas throughout this series. And I want to share his plan for connecting the Dragon of Icefire Peak to these modules and keeping the focus on the dragons. 
So here's a tip from Cart Mageddon. To connect this better with Dragon of Icebuyer Peak, what if the Dragon Spirit was instead as Draka from the Dragon Barrow quest? And when the players took the Dragon Slayer sword, they inadvertently released it, making the players at least partially responsible for the events after DOIP. Plus, it explains why the spirit doesn't possess the Bronze Dragon from Sleeping Dragon's Wake, as by being the spirit of a green dragon, it can then only possess another green dragon. Alternatively, if you have the luxury of running this from the start with these expansions already out, then I'd make the dragon spirit belong to Ebendeth in Dragon Barrow, because they sound a whole lot cooler and are better connected with Mirkul. Of course, that also means changing Claw Giliomitar to a black dragon to keep with the same color reasoning to avoid the bronze dragon issue, but hey, Lost Mine of Fandelver already had a green dragon, so let's spice it up. Lastly, the visions from DOIP could be used to foreshadow the dragon spirit. For example, the last one showing Cryovane's location could show its shadow come to life and consume everything in sight. The players will think this means the dragon must be stopped, but in actuality, the visions are trying to show the true threat on the horizon, that dragon spirit. Thanks Carp for all the inspiration along the way, and thank you for leaving comments and liking these videos because those simple actions really help the channel. And if you want to join Carp, myself, and other creative DMs and players in our Discord community, use the links below to become a patron like Max, Adam, Yorgos, Dan, Brady, and Pablo did this week, or join the YouTube member club like Alan did this week, or join both like Jackalware Knoll Civil War just did. And besides Discord, patrons get a ton of additional content, like our monthly podcasts, adventure locations, NPCs, behind-the-scene videos, one-on-one -on -one hangouts with me, and now PDF guides for each video in the Icewind Dale series, because their support truly makes these videos possible. Now, here's the exciting news. My education job has finally started up again, and to thank you for your overwhelming support during my layoff, and to keep this community growing strong, I'll be giving away a hard copy of Tasha's Cauldron of Everything if we reach 10,000 subscribers by November 16th, just before the release date. This Saturday, I'll be posting all the details on the community tab about how to enter and how there may be multiple winners, so be sure to subscribe and hit the little bell icon to get a notification when that post goes live. Again, thank you for all your support, and keep building.